Hi, this is Matt Welsh with Spiritual Media Blog, and today I'm here with Judy Lambert, author of The Light, A Modern Day Journey for Peace, and also author of A Mother Goddess for Our Time, Mary's Appearances at Medjugorje. Judy, thanks so much for being here today. Oh, thank you. Good morning, Matt. It's so nice to be here. It's uh, it's uh, in the evening in Bangkok, where I'm calling you from, where we're, where we're talking from, and this is where we live. Oh, that's great. That's so cool. Um, well, to get started, why don't you talk about um, your book, The Light, A Modern Day Journey for Peace. Um, what is that about, and why did you write it? Okay, here, here, here's a close-up of it. And uh, this is the light uh, representational of the light of the near-death experience. And there's a little key, if you can see right here. And that key is uh, for the fact that this is fundamental to the book and foundational for the book, the near light, uh, the near-death experience in the light. And my book ponders that the light of the near-death experience is actually the bedrock of religion and the common denominator for a global spirituality. And I wrote the book because uh, I would like to improve people's outlook toward religions and cultures and uh, let people know where we agree in a tangible and visible manner. I want people to walk away with knowledge and um, understand the esoteric side to the world's great religions better. Yeah, that's great. And I think... Um near-death experiences are such a universal thread you hear across all different religions and cultures. Um, right. So why don't you tell a little bit more about that? What are some interesting stories you have heard from people who have had near-death experiences and what sort of impact has that had on their lives? Okay, well, for certain, the near-death experience is a profound, uh, something very profound that has happened to people and we know that from the resuscitations that we're hearing, uh, medical resuscitations. And people often, often say they're, they feel like they, after they've had the experience that they are starting over. Often they become more religious. Um, they want to be better people. And they want to speak or write about their experiences sometimes. Um, that's quite common, actually. Maybe they'll give up their addictions. Um, and from my own personal experience, uh, my dream experience actually became a spiritual summons, as it was. Um, my family and these dreams have become my life's mission. Um, and so I had to search for a context to those dreams. Um, well, I definitely want to come back to um, the dreamed part because that's really interesting. But um, I'm curious how at first you would respond to... Um, some of the skeptics who say that near-death experience is just a change in your brain and not any proof of afterlife. Right, right. Well, um, brains live, die, we fall in love, all in a mix or, uh, of chemical reactions. And so saying that NDEs are just chemistry doesn't actually uh, disprove anything one way or the other. When you're hungry, uh, is it real or is it just a chemical experience? Um, of course, I believe in an afterlife, but um, I don't think there's really any clear-cut uh, answer as to whether there's an afterlife or, life or not. Um, and since we can't prove it either way, I think what's really important is to shift our focus uh, to the insights that people who have had these experiences uh, can provide us. Um, uh, which comes brings to mind is um, Dr. Eben uh, Alexander in his book, Proof of Heaven. Yeah, that's really a, a, a interesting, um, uh, he's a great speaker and is very interesting. He's a neurosurgeon, so he's quite an extreme, extremely credible, <clears throat> pardon me, spokesperson for the phenomenon. And um, he was... Uh, basically died, near, uh, had a near-death experience, should have been a vegetable, and came back. And his life was completely altered uh, from, from this. And uh, it's a life-changing event. And so I don't think we can really dismiss uh, what these people are saying to us. And we actually have a vast database now 
and not just of medical uh, resuscitations, but historical too, if what we're looking at. I brought along a picture, <clears throat> and this, I don't, can, am, am I close enough? Yeah. This, okay, this is from um, uh, the Divine Comedy and Dante's Paradiso. Um, and Dante was writing about this in the 1300s. Uh, and you can see that people are looking into the, the, this light. They're very similar to what the experiences that we're talking about today in these resuscitations. Uh, you see, um, and Dante spoke that said that people that encountered this light and looked at the, that there was a light in the beyond, and when they encountered it, that it gave them great peace. Um, Plato spoke about uh, or wrote about uh, the near-death experience too. We we feel another another individual from the 1500s. This is uh, Bosch, who was a uh, religious. Uh, can you see this one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He Maybe was a religious bring it down painter. just an inch. Perfect. Um, he was a religious painter, and you can see people being escorted into the light by angels, and uh, he. Uh, was doing these paintings for the church in the 50, uh, 1500s, I believe. And uh, so you see the dark void around. It's a classic near-death experience, better than some of our photographic uh, images, in fact. I really like this one. So, uh, but we also have many moderns who have uh, testified to, to this concept, such as Thier Thierry de Chardin, who was a Jesuit priest, uh, his writings were banned by the Catholic Church for a time, um, but uh, later now, now they're available. And he spoke that at the end of creation would all turn into light. So <clears throat> we have a, a, a vast compendium uh, coming together for us to, to pick and choose from with our, our Internet chain uh, age, you know. Sure. And you showed those, those pictures of the light. Is that a common experience amongst, I mean, universally, pretty much everyone who's had near-death experiences, they see some sort of light and they're going towards it? Is that common? I think that's very common. Um, you'll have a whole uh, a variety of degrees and, and people telling you in, in uh, different things with what happened to them. And, and like uh, Dr. Eben Alexander in Proof of Heaven, he spoke of this afterlife, and many people are focused on the, the, what happened to them on the other side. Um, well, for me, uh, it, it was quite a bit different. Now, I, I had three, uh, I had a series of dreams that um, uh, were, they were dreams. They were not, I did not have a near-death experience in the classic sense that I, I wasn't close to death. I I didn't need a resuscitation. I didn't have a medical emergency. Um, also, I did not see Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad in my dream. There was no great one. And many people profess that they see the, uh, uh, these meet these great ones in their near death experience, and I did not. So, from the classic from a, a classic point of view, my my dream experiences were different. And what and what happened during your dream experiences? I had, I'll talk to you about three. I've had more than that, obviously, or, you know, to, to, that I could speak toward. But three were really instrumental in me writing uh, and and my books. And the first one, uh, <clears throat> boy, let's see. My, the first one, I was in a I was a puppet with my head down, and I'm in a void, a black void. But I'm not afraid. And as I look up. There's this beautiful orb of light directly in front of me, and I'm irresistibly drawn to it. As I get there, I have an overwhelming feeling of love, and as I look at at it, I realize I am seeing God. Wow. I am me yeah, as powerful, and immediately I'm back awake, and uh, and I'm bewildered about what just happened, and the sense of love is stays with me for a long time. It was very profound. The second dream that I had was similar. In, uh, I, I'm in my house, and um, a beautiful orb of light comes down, 
and I'm on my knees worshiping it, and in the orb of light, I see all of these religions. I see the cultures, I see languages, and it's just this beautiful orb of white and white and the love, the profound love, and as it, it then it leaves, it starts to go away and I cry for it to return. But no image of an individual in that. It was just teeming with life and, and it was so beautiful. Uh, the third dream I, I can share uh, was very, uh, uh, very different too. Uh, again, I'm like a puppet suspended in this dark void and tunnel. And as I look up, I see two orbs of light coming together as one. I'm drawn to it and I understand that it, you know, it's, uh, the communication is such that that you understand that what's going on. And I understand that this is the pineal and the pituitary gland coming together. Mm -hmm. And a voice then comes and says, you will soon be able to hear God better. Of wow. course, doubting Thomas, I say, huh. well, I, I, I say in, in the dream, I say, uh, when will this occur? And uh, the voice responds in 400 years. And I say, oh, that's a really long time. <laughs> and the voice again responds, not by, uh, maybe by man's time, but not by God's. I awaken. And, and, and once again, with the love and bewildered about what has just happened to me. But in metaphysical circles, you know, the pineal gland, the pituitary gland are very, very important for communication with uh, the divine. So uh, this very, those were very powerful dreams and were very inspiring. And I needed to come to uh, put these dreams into context for myself because when I read the literature, you know, Ray Moody's Life After Life, Melvin Morris's Closer to the Light, um, Betty Eade's Embrace by the Light, and Kubler-Ross's work uh, on death and dying, my dreams didn't fit the classic near-death experience. So I went to school and um, got eventually got a, uh, my graduate degree in religious studies, and I continued to look for an answer and a context to my own dream experiences. And, and, and this took a long time to process, and that is also not something uh, unusual uh, because the per you know. It, it, they're just so out of context. And so I looked to Christianity and I started looking for this thread of light through our religions. And as I looked at Christianity uh, and that <clears throat> the uh, Bible is virtually a, a handbook of light, if, you, if you're looking for it, from Moses to the prophets to, to Jesus in the book of Revelation, Islam is also a wash in the light. Uh, Muslims believe that there is a, a, a niche in each of our hearts, an actual physical cavity in our hearts where um, the, pre the spark of the divine resides. And that spark is actually replicated in their prayer carpets and um, in, their, in their niche in, in the mosque, the directional niche called the Qibla. Um, uh, so that's quite interesting. Buddhism has the idea of the clear light where the yogi adept trains to meet the light um, through, through training. Um, Hinduism speaks of rivers of light. Uh, ancient cultures, also in my book, I, I, I look at ancient cultures and uh, um, worship, sun worship in, in particular, and as this, this innervating thread throughout time. So, sorry, everyone. Yeah, that was great. I mean, that would be a really powerful dream to have. I mean, after sort of processing all of it, I mean, did you, what were some of your takeaways for you? What did that experience or dream mean for you or sort of impact did that have on your life? Well, I, I, I had to, I would say very much like the near-death experience, even though they're dreams, they were near-death experiences. And I think that, that the, these, these things that come to people in the near-death experience are very much tailor-made for the individual. And because of my interest in religion, I started pursuing uh, where they fit in that context for myself. Um, but my feeling is that spirituality shouldn't be boring. And 
I'm hoping that my book is, uh, people will find my book informative and entertaining. It's a spiritual travel log where the reader comes along with me to Egypt and Syria, India, Nepal, and Japan in search of the light. And I've been fortunate uh, uh, to travel to these places in my own personal spiritual quest. And I want the reader to meet and to know um, inspiring archaeologists and Sufi guides and Christian priests and learned professors and Indian palm readers and liberated scientists. They're all in my book and, and as we search for this worldwide dynamic. Definitely. Yeah, I think traveling is one of the best ways to sort of feel more connected to other people and even our ourself or our spirit. So definitely. Um, and I'm, I am curious, too, to hear a little bit more about the dream interpretation. Um, and I know you have some experience in doing that for other people. I mean, I'm wondering, what are some common dreams people have told you about and what do you think they mean? Okay. I'm, I'm versed in, um, in what's called an interviewing technique. I studied with Dr. Gail Delaney in San Francisco, and this interviewing technique, uh, it, I ask a series of non-invasive questions to the dreamer to, so that they can come to what's called an aha response within them and claim their dream for themselves. So I'm not telling you what your dream means. In fact, you come to the meaning yourself. Most dreams take between a half an hour, 15 minutes, a half an hour, and some dreams a little bit longer to, to get to the personal, your own personal meaning. But your dreams are tailor-made for you, and uh, it, you will know when you've had this aha experience. Um, as far as common dreams, well, uh, let's say, uh, let's see, flying dreams are fairly common, but not all flying dreams uh, mean the same thing. Uh, one person might have a flying dream where it's very euphoric. Another person could have a dream where people are actually throwing rocks at them or, or wires are holding them back or they're flying into birds. So you can see how those two dreams are really quite different. Um, and so your symbols are uh, uh, particular to you based on your feeling and uh, toward that symbol and the feeling of the dream as well. Uh, Let's see, another, uh, uh, people might have falling dreams, but once again, they're always different. They're, they're different for you. That's why dream dictionaries really don't work. <laughs> you can't just lump some, you know, everything together. Um, another, uh, uh, to give you a better idea about that, uh, maybe let's talk about a German shepherd as a symbol. You may have grown up with German shepherds and you love them. And for me, I may be definitely afraid of a German Shepherd. So you can see that our dreams are going to be very different in the final uh, interpretation. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a really useful process, sort of helping people unpack the dream for themselves rather than just simply telling them this is what this dream means for you. I'm now offering my services online as well, and uh, I've taught dream interpretation classes in the past and done personal consultations, and, and now I'm, I'm offering it through Skype. That's great. I mean, um, I'm, I'm currently getting a PhD in psychology, and a lot of people are like, oh, can you tell me what my dream means? And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's really hard. I mean, I can, your process is be a, much better to help people unpack it for themselves. <laughs> Well, and it's very exciting, and you both know, the dreamer and the person that's asking these non-intrusive questions both know immediately when you've had that aha connection. I like it's, that. It's, it's really revealing. I like it, too. It's so exciting because they're very much help. They're very helpful for your day life. Yeah. And that's, you know, they're giving us, uh, you know, answers. They're funny, and they're fun to, to interpret, and they're a halfway to the subconscious they're free and they they really are pertain to what's going on in your life right now very interesting um, yeah i wonder if you could sort of apply that same process to like synchronicity or coincidences because sometimes strange things happen to people and they're like hmm i wonder what that means and they kind of struggle with that i think so I, that sounds that sounds so interesting too. I, I think so. I think our, our life is just this 
amazing thing, isn't it? So, right, right. Why not? And I also wanted to spend some time talking about your other book. Unless, was there anything about the light that we didn't touch upon that you feel like was interesting or helpful? Well, one, one of the other things I'd like to uh, mention before we move to, to the other book, uh, um, that, that our current religious structures are, are vertical systems and uh, expressions toward God, like, like, uh, Christianity, it's a vertical expression. Islam, they're vertical expression, expressions. Buddhism, Hinduism, they're all looking up. And these vertical expressions have separated us. I don't think they've been, they were meant to do so, but we could really use a horizontal structure that would let us celebrate our diversity and our unity at once. Um, essentially kind of a spiritual blanket with our globalization, a spiritual blanket that could cover the earth. A con the concept of a one world light uh, would provide an architectural element um, that is sorely needed. I think that we are all wanting the next cycle to be a light age and a time of spiritual oneness. And with education, um, I think these things, this is possible. We teach, there's so much generational anger, we could teach for peace and connection with each other. So I wanted to say that. No, I'm glad you did because I think that's truly um, something that gets missed in religion and spirituality. It's sometimes it's either so focused on connecting with God or just connecting with yourself that we lose out on connecting with other people. Right, right. And, and that thread and that, is for me, this the the, the light is really a, a common denominator for a global spirit, and um, and it that it might be the springboard for a spiritual unity on a global basis. Definitely, definitely. Um, all right, what well, I I did want to hear more about your other book. Was there any other thoughts you wanted to share about the light? Gosh, I got kind of passionate there about that. Yeah, no. No, that's great. Yeah, I'm glad. You, I'm glad. I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think connecting with other people is something that gets missed out and talks about religion and spirituality. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. So that's good. And if we could see that between ourselves and, and other religions, I think we might get on better and have more. Uh, have a peaceful, more peaceful planet. I agree. And I even think, uh, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent, but I even think our own personal relationships with um, family members or friends or romantic partners, even that sort of horizontal connection can also lead us closer to, to God or spirituality. Absolutely. I think it's all about the here and now, the, the day life. Yeah. I'm in <laughs> agreement with that and that that focus has to be right here, local. Huh? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, I could probably we could probably spend another hour just talking about just that topic. Um, but I I do I am curious to hear about your other book. Um, even the title itself caught my attention. It's um, a mother goddess for our time. Mary's appearances at Medjugorje. Um, right. So tell us about this book. Okay. Here's the cover close up of it. It also comes out and came out September one. Uh, as a second edition, and I've had the fortunate opportunity to travel to Medjugorje 12 times on pilgrimage, and this is a memoir of my experiences there. Um, there are six children who have had daily apparitions in the tiny Bosnian town of Medjugorje and, um, for over 25 years, and uh, there is it's a, a wonderful place uh, to connect with. And my book, actually, because I was not raised with a lot of religion and I come as an outsider, um, looks at what, how the feminine, uh, the goddess traditions are alive through the Virgin Mary. And um, I use dreams as a uh, pivotal point for the book as well. Yeah, and you said there's children who've had visions right. for. Now, does that mean that? Now, did I follow that right? They're 25 years old and they've had six separate visions over the past 25 years. Oh, sorry, maybe I didn't make that clear. No, about 
25 years ago, six children started oh. having apparitions. And at first, all of the children had daily apparitions. Then it slowly weaned down so that only about three of them currently are having uh, apparitions on a regular basis. The other three have maybe yearly apparitions just once a year. And the, these um, are still going on right now? Still going on. There are millions of people that are have gone to Medjugorje uh, to, and experienced um, just incredible, wonderful miracles, of course, but uh, cleansing of, 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 you know, the heart and uh, personal peace. And um, it's a very exciting place. Yeah, I mean, that sounds incredible. Um, what sort of visions have they been having and what have they been saying? Call them, they call them apparitions. And um, I guess that the, the virgin comes down because everybody else doesn't see them. Oh. Uh, children see them. And they, they, the, uh, Mary apparently gives messages to the children that are translated into a number of different languages so that you can... Uh, you know, know what is being said, and she always prefaces them, dear children, today I want you to, you know, do, you know, please hear my call, please respond to my call of peace. She's always about peace, you know, to try to, and, and I had a, a, a great experience there, um, and, and, uh, uh, you know, it just a, a cleansing, a purification, and and uh, and I'm more peaceful for having gone there. That sounds yeah, that sounds great. And so, if I understand correct, it sounds like the book is a description of these apparitions and your experience there. My experience is that as, as an outsider to Catholicism oh. and um, how the goddess traditions are actually part of the. Um, the uh, foundation of the Marian visitations and how those are interwoven. So it looks as, as an outsider to try to get people to be a little bit more open to what's going on inside the church. Oh, that's, yeah, that's great. That's I mean, feminine again, expression, right. Yeah. And that seems to sort of tie into what you were saying a little bit earlier about more of a horizontal connection with the other people who from all yeah. different religions and cultures. Right, right, because anybody can go there, especially if you can drop, you know, the fact that it's very Catholic. And, you know, I wasn't raised Catholic, so I had to learn to, you know, uh, uh, go to Mass and say the Rosary and things like that. But that you know, because I come from a background of meditation <laughs> and rituals. So, you know, I was raised in California and I, you know, I'm a child of, of, from Berkeley, essentially. And, you know, we were just a roll feed and chanting and these things. So, um, but I, you know, I, I believe that, that anybody could go there and have a wonderful experience. That's just, uh, you know, I did a lot of meditation there. That's great. Yeah. And that sounds like it truly was a wonderful experience. Any Anything more about that book or your personal experience you want to share with our listeners? Well, I guess, I guess there's a lot of miracles that go on there. And I was fortunate to, enough to see many of them. Uh, I went, originally I'd been teaching a, a dream interpretation class to a group of Catholic women in Saudi Arabia. I lived in Saudi Arabia for a number of years. And um, I, as I, they started talking about Medjugorje, and I thought to myself, well, if I truly want to be a spiritual person and open, I can't really deny what these women are telling me about Medjugorje. So I'm going to go along with them on a pilgrimage. And I was hooked after, after the first uh, uh, pilgrimage that I went on, which was for about 12 days. And during that pilgrimage, one of the... One of the gals, Rosary, who that had been in the family for, um, for uh, since from her grandmother's time or before, um, the Rosary had changed to gold, except for the. I know this sounds absolutely crazy, but it changed to gold. I saw it myself. I saw it before. I saw it after it changed, and honestly, I was absolutely dumbfounded. Now, 
these outer experiences, the sun spins in the sky. I mean, you can see that every day. The, there are bleeding crucifixes on the way up the mountain. There's just so many people. There will be healings and all kinds of interesting things. But what's really important, of course, is as you, as you mature spiritually, and as I matured, I should say, uh, the, the, what happened, what was going on in the inside is I was becoming clean. And I was unloading a lot of my own pain body stuff. And uh, it was a, just a profound experience for me. And if you can get yourself to Medjugorje and you can meditate and pray, it doesn't really matter what religion you are. Just go. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. And <laughs> um, now I'm curious, too, when you say this uh, cleansing process, um was there anything that you were doing to help yourself become like more spiritually clean or was it just a natural process? I think it's a natural process, except that you really have to work hard for it. Uh, that's contradictory, I guess. But <laughs> you, you know, I prayed and meditated for three to five hours a day minimum. Oh, wow. Every day. And so with that and you could probably do that at home but I don't know many of us that are so pilgrimage really serves a, a, a purpose doesn't it because you leave everything behind and you go in in search of you know a better a better interior life and uh, and it's possible it's certainly possible and you know you just can't these kids are having this apparition and there is no denying something amazing is going on with these, these children who are now adults uh, as old as I am uh, I mean, not quite but but uh, uh, you know 50 I think that the oldest one is 50 now so um, uh, they were young when it first started I think the youngest one was uh, maybe nine years old and uh, now that's some 30 years later so quite it's quite a fascinating place that's yeah. Now I really want to leave my home and go there right now. <laughs> go if you can. It's you know I don't know beautiful. So yeah. I've been very fortunate to, to have had these experiences, and and I feel very lucky that uh, uh, that I'm able to express them now through my books. Yeah, and, that's and, great. Yeah. Um, and if people want to get in touch with you or your or get your copy of your book how can they get in touch with you and how can they get copies of your books okay i, I have a website it's uh, www.judithlambertbooks.com and of course my books are available on amazon and i have a few youtube videos as well oh, nice. under Judith, Judith lambert books they're kind of fun <laughs> nice so, nice yeah um, thank you so, yeah and is there um I mean, these are topics that I feel like I could talk about just all day, but um, it's, um, it's amazing what our world and you know is coming. Have, uh, just the availability of information to share these things is just awesome. Right, right. Well, I told I really appreciate you taking time out of your day um, to be with us. And um, is there anything else you want to uh, share with our viewers? Wow, I don't, I don't know. Um, let me think just a second. Um, I think I've pretty much covered most everything, and I want to thank you for having me on. I, I really love what you're bringing to the world through your website. Oh, thanks. It's so much, yeah, so much of our media is a vehicle for expressing negative events. It's, it's refreshing to meet someone like you as a champion of spiritual media, and I'm honored that you would have me on to speak. Um, so I'm just delighted to be part of the consciousness community that uh, is being sustained by people like yourself. Oh, uh, love I Thanks again, Matt. Oh, well, thank you. And we will uh, leave it at that. That was very, very kind words of you. And I really appreciate that. Thank right. you. Have a nice day. All right.